Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick Gard, and with me, as always, are the three people who have spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's the author of Duty, Honor, Empire, a 25th century love story, and my own personal little mule, Chris Pepe Haley. Hey, I'll go four-wheeling with you any day. Also with us is a woman who can only be described as a world-class, hopeless romantic, Lori Flores. Hello. <laughs> so, hello. That sounds like a hopeless romantic. Right? I was just going to say, doesn't that sound hello. hopelessly romantic? <laughs> Finally, the youngest member of our group and the man who's always someone's best time, Matt Palmer. Keeping this podcast in a safe place. Good to hear. <laughs> Well, welcome back, everyone. This week we are reviewing one of Chris's favorite films, 1984's classic adventure comedy, Romancing the Stone. Uh, and Chris, do you have a summary for us? Uh, I do. Chris, I have a question for you. Sure. Does this summary go slow like the snail or fast like a shooting star? It goes fast like a shooting star. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Can you tell me a story? Romance novelist Joan Wilder is forced to rush off to Cartagena, Colombia, to help free her sister Elaine, who has been kidnapped by some small-time smugglers. They are looking for a treasure map that Elaine's recently murdered husband mailed to Joan before his death. Once in Colombia, Joan is tricked into taking the wrong bus to Cartagena by the evil but sexy Colonel Zolo, the very man responsible for Elaine's husband's death. Once they are in the middle of the inhospitable jungle, their bus crashes and the passengers flee the scene with their livestock, leaving Zolo alone with Joan. He takes this opportunity to kill her for the map, but he is thwarted by a mysterious bird smuggler named Jack T. Colton, who swoops down from the lush hills and rescues her. Joan pays Jack $375 to get her out of the jungle and to the nearest payphone, so she can call her sister's captors. Along the way, they stumble upon a smuggler's plane that crashed some time ago and discover that it's full of marijuana. They decide to stay the night there in relative safety and smoke the night away. In the morning, they meet Juan, the drug lord the crashed plane was smuggling for. It turns out he is a big, big fan of a plethora of Joan Wilder's novels. He helps them escape Zolo and his private army in his Ford Bronco that he affectionately calls his little mule. They end up at a small village where Joan arranges to meet her sister's kidnappers. Jack, on the other hand, gets busy seducing Joan Wilder with a night of romantic dancing. After some south-of-the-border boning, he convinces Joan to find the treasure referred to as El Corazon, or the heart. Is there any other kind of boning, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> well, there is in the ear if you're a Catholic, but that's something else. He convinces Joan to find the treasure referred to as El Corazon, or the heart, first. They manage to find the treasure, which it turns out to be a big green emerald-shaped, as you would guess, a heart. But before they can flee, Ralph, one of Elaine's kidnappers, appears and takes the booty. But before Ralph can flee, Zolo and his troops appear and try to capture everyone. Jack snatches back El Corazon from Ralph and then escapes with Joan over a waterfall. They both survive the fall, but end up on opposite sides of an impassable river. Joan and the map on one side, Jack and the treasure on the other. 
Jack tells Joan to trust him, and he will meet her in Cartagena with the treasure. Reluctantly, Joan agrees, and she seeks out Ira, the head kidnapper with the most evil name ever uttered in Hollywood cinema. Joan gives Ira the map, and Ira gives Joan Elaine. But before anyone can flee, Zolo and his merry men appear, with Jack T. Colton and Ralph in tow. An 80s-style fight ensues when Jack reveals he has Joan's corazón wrapped around his dick. The little treasure slides down his pant leg and onto his boot. Jack flings it in the air, and Zolo catches it before it falls into a pit of hungry crocodiles with big snappers. Unfortunately for Zolo, one of the crocs jumps out of the water and bites off his hand with the emerald still in it. Jack runs after the croc to get back what he worked so hard to steal. While he struggles to keep the big crocodile from sliding into the ocean, Joan and Elaine fight it out with Zolo. Jack lets go of the crocodile and tries to scale a stone wall to save his other love, but it's unnecessary. Joan manages to sidestep Zolo when he charges at her, and he falls into the crocodile pit. He is eaten alive like a crocodile. Now that Joan's safe, Jack gives her a big kiss and tells her not to tell the cops he was there, and then jumps back in the water to get that emerald. Joan goes back to her home in New York City and writes her greatest novel based on the experience she just had. But it's not a sad ending for our romance novelist. Jack magically reappears in front of her house one day with a brand new boat and a pair of genuine crocodile boots. The two set sail on a new life and live happily ever after, or until they make a crappy sequel about a jewel of the now that takes place six months after this film. Films are influenced by the times they're made in, and we look back at some of those important events in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time. Well, here's a look at what was happening around the world in 1984. The Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, was assassinated by her Sikh bodyguards at her home in New Delhi. Riots erupted throughout India. Geraldine Ferraro became the first woman to run as a vice presidential running mate alongside Walter Mondale. Ronald Reagan won in a landslide. Stonewashed jeans were introduced. I had a pair. Did you guys? No. no. Did you have... No, really? I Chris folded did. mine Come over on. at the bottom and then rolled them up because that's the only way to wear them. Exactly. No, and I, they looked good. I remember when you had them, though. The Summer Olympics were held in Los Angeles, California. The Soviet Union boycotted. Mary Lou Retton won five medals, including a gold for the women's individual all-round in gymnastics. Dr. Robert Gallo announced at a press conference at the National Cancer Institute that he had discovered the virus that caused AIDS. This was not without controversy as he had been working with French scientists from the Pasteur Institute and kind of left them out of that announcement. And then that became the movie and the band played on? That was a good movie. Yes, it was. was. Good... Um, the first infomercial aired on television due to deregulation by the FCC. Really? Of all the things not to regulate? <laughs> Apple first sold the Macintosh personal computer. It was the first PC that came with 128 kilobytes of memory. The cost was $2,495. Also in 1984, Bell Labs introduced the one megabyte memory chip. According to the costofliving.com, the average house in 1984 cost $79,900, and the average car set you back a little under $9,000. And a gallon of gas only cost $1.21. In entertainment, Michael Jackson's hair caught on fire while he was filming a Pepsi commercial. Bob Geldof organized the recording Do They Know It's Christmas by a group of musical artists they called Band-Aid. The song raised $14 million for famine relief in Africa. The Cosby Show premiered on NBC. And 1984 was a wonderful year for moviegoers. Classics such as Footloose, The Terminator, Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Amadeus, Red Dawn, 16 Candles, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and this week's pick by Chris, Romancing the Stone, all were playing in theaters in 1984. 
usually we start with casting the film, and the lead actor in this film is Michael Douglas, who is essentially the most well-established film actor in this. But when this film came out, the last film he had done was The Star Chamber, which was not a huge success, and he'd had supporting roles in previous films like The China Syndrome, but he is not really known as a lead actor. I thought it was interesting that they wanted Stallone and Christopher Reeve originally were the ones who were offered the part and turned it down. Um, what did you guys think of Michael Douglas in this film? And kind of, do you see this as the beginning of his lead actor career? And Chris, since it's your film, why don't you start? I definitely liked him in this. I couldn't see Stallone or Christopher Reeve in this. Stallone was too much Rambo at this point. And this film, he wasn't supposed to be like a great adventurer. I think he was supposed to be a little naive in some ways. The only other person I would have considered was Kurt Russell for this part, but I think he did a fine job. And I don't really remember him doing much before this film that was of notoriety. So I think this did start him off. No Harrison Ford. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harrison could have done a great job. Well, Harrison was making another Indiana Jones film that same year. So he couldn't have made this film at that time. You know, I didn't feel strongly one way or the other. I didn't strongly dislike him, and I didn't think, oh, no one else could have done this role. I thought he did a fine job. And I would agree that this was probably his breakout to leading man status. I'm not a huge Michael Douglas fan. I've liked him in a couple of movies, and I don't dislike him in this movie. I agree with Lori. This is a role that a lot of guys probably could have done just as well. I wouldn't call it a powerful performance by any stretch, but he pulls it off. I like Michael Douglas, and this was probably my first real introduction to him when I was a kid as an actor. I'd seen him in The China Syndrome, but as a kid, I literally saw that probably in the late 70s, early 80s. And I saw that at a drive-in with my parents, and I don't remember him being in it. And I didn't like the film. I was just going along because whatever it was paired with was probably more interesting to me. I really liked him in this role. This is what I remember first liking him and caused me to follow his career from this point afterwards with Jewel of the Nile, which I really looked forward to when it came out a year later. You know, Wall Street. I'm trying to think of the other films he did. Uh, Fatal Attraction, you know, War of the Roses and, uh, you know, Basic Instinct. He had a series of films after this that just seemed to be he was just on a roll. So it's weird to think that I always think of him as a very established Hollywood icon, primarily due to his you know pedigree of being Kirk Douglas' son. But in a short period of time, in a couple of years after this, he wins the Best Actor Oscar for Wall Street. He really wasn't, it wasn't like he was Hollywood royalty as far as like, you know, an actor who had just been in the lead role for a long time. So it's it's weird how I romanticize him and think he's always been there, but he really wasn't there until this film. I watched um, some of the extras on the DVD, uh -huh. and he mentioned that back then it was a lot harder for a television actor to break into films. Yeah, and he came out of the streets of San Francisco, not mm -hmm. like... The show, not just literally the streets of San Francisco, I'm with Carl Malden and kind of struggled for a few years. And as I said, he'd, he'd done the Star Chamber, but I think prior to the Star Chamber, prior to 1984, Star Chamber he did in like 82, 83, but he hadn't done another film prior to that since 1980. So he was, he was almost an out-of-work actor at this time. What about Kathleen Turner? You know, playing the female lead in this uh, interesting story that I read doing my research for the film. Michael Douglas originally wanted Deborah Winger, and she had met with him. And in the meeting, she'd ended up biting him. <laughs> what? Wait, wait, wait. I need more of that story. That's all it says is that they went to a lunch meeting to discuss the part, and she ended up biting him during that lunch meeting. So she did not get the part. <laughs> Did he make an advance? Or I have. Something? Well, we all know Michael Douglas is, a, you know, as a as a sex addict, so maybe he did. But yeah. What part did he? She bite. That's the question. <laughs> it it did not say. But the fact that Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas in the eighties were one of the quintessential film couples. I mean, they had three films that they did together. They talked about doing other films together after that, and even into the two thousands. They talked about coming back and doing a second sequel to this film that Michael Douglas is working on development and bringing Kathleen Turner back, although I think her days were long behind her at that point in time. 
she's also not known as a leading actor. She had done Body Heat a couple of years before this, which got her a lot of attention, but wasn't a huge box office success. But the only other major film she had done was The, the Man with Two Brains with Steve Martin. So it's feast or famine with her. But this establishes her as a lead actress. Very shortly after this, she does Peggy Sue Got Married and is becomes one of the lead actresses for the late 80s who's always approached for every role. What did you think of her in the role? Again, I didn't feel super strongly. I thought she did a good job. I felt a little more strongly about her than I did about Michael Douglas. But again, I just didn't, you know, it wasn't an Academy Award performance, but it was good. I'm trying to place it in the context of what they're trying to do in this movie. It was, you know, that kind of romance novel. And she kind of plays this a little over the top as far as the, you know, helpless female being rescued by the guy. And I, I give her a break because I think that's what they wanted out of this movie. And she definitely got it to him. It just felt a little too forceful to me. Oh, I disagree. I didn't find her character the helpless female. Well, that's what she was at the beginning, without a doubt. I mean, she gets saved by Michael Douglas while they're on the road. And, I mean, her character grows and changes throughout the film and grows, becomes more confident. And But she, she was just too trusting. She, she wasn't too trusting. She was a damsel in distress at the beginning of the film. Well, but she, yeah. Becomes, yeah. Uh, she becomes a much stronger character by the end. That's her evolution. Not necessarily a believable one but it's that's her evolution yeah i thought she was supposed to be kind of a sheltered city slicker that basically just lived at home with her cat in a romanticized world and that she was scared to leave that city but once she got her bearings in this strangest of places going from an urban jungle to a real jungle that she realized there are a lot of similarities and she had the toughness within her. So I think she did a fine job. I will say that this is also another role that a lot of other women could have played too, but I liked her in this role. Yeah, I don't really have much to add other than I, I do agree that a lot of other actresses can pl have played it. I do think she has good chemistry with Michael Douglas, but I think she has better chemistry with Michael Douglas in the next two films, Jewel of the Nile and War of the Roses, I like their chemistry in those films better than it does in this. This one, it seems a little jilted, a little stunted, especially in the early parts of the film. And I never necessarily buy the romance between the two of them in this film. What I do like about this film and their performances is the adventure that they take, but not necessarily the romantic angle of it. What about the little halfling in this film, Danny DeVito? Just kind of repeating here, not known really as a film actor until this film. He'd been in films. He'd been in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson. He'd been in Terms of Endearment with Jack Nicholson, but in supporting roles. But he's primarily known as a television actor for Taxi until this film. And then after that, he has a fairly successful film career, usually in some sort of comedy role or supporting role, but without a doubt, a very well-established career until he spins that off into directing with War of the Roses with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. What did you guys think of Danny DeVito in this film? Is he small enough to make this technically a fantasy film? Yes. Okay. Well, then He was almost small enough to be on Fantasy Island. <laughs> <laughs> this, to me, is just the perfect Danny DeVito role. I mean, I, I like him in this role a lot. And I think this is this is just the way I think of him, uh, <laughs> that, you know, that the kind of conniving comedic character. So I, I think this is this is perfect, Danny DeVito. Prior to this film, when I thought of Danny DeVito, I of course thought of him in Taxi, and also back in the day, I think on HBO was Going Ape. Do you guys remember yeah, that with Tony Danza? With Tony Danza and uh, all of the orangutans, or is that what they were? I think so. Yeah. So that was my experience with Danny DeVito. So he was probably the most well-known to me in this whole film. So I gravitated toward him instantly. Plus, we were about the same size. And, you know, I, I can relate to that. The Danny DeVito character was one that I cannot see someone else playing. I thought he was just perfect for that role and, and hilarious. And, and I agree with um, Matt that it's just the perfect Danny DeVito role. Yeah, I, I agree with both Matt, I, basically all three of you, that this is the role that I can't imagine someone else doing but Danny DeVito. 
and is probably my favorite favorite character in the film that he's supposed to be a bad guy but i'm more interested in what he's doing than what the other two are doing in the film for most of the film specifically even the bad guy zolo i don't really care for him at all and i was really glad when they brought him back in the sequel because he's i mean he's the comic relief of the film especially in the sequel to talk about the director not normally uh robert zemeckis is what i would consider an a-list director who doesn't get necessarily the attention that a lot of people would think of this is his big breakout film that he'd done used cars before this but uh this film and he follows us up with a small little film called back to the future uh, that he does the very next year he's supposed to do cocoon but 20th century fox thinks this film is so bad and is going to bomb so poorly that they pull him off that project which freed him up to be able to go direct back to the future so it actually worked out for him that he didn't have to direct cocoon which ron howard ended up doing but i didn't i, I don't really care for that film <laughs> I uh, went on to direct the other Back to the Future films, Forrest Gump, where he won Best Director for, so I blame him for that. Contact mm -hmm. with Jodie Foster, What Lies Beneath with Harrison Ford and Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, The Polar Express, which is now many people consider a quintessential holiday film, and most recently directed Flight. He's covered a lot of films. Every one of those films is very different from the other, and it's one of the things I've liked about him. Didn't come back to direct the sequel, though, which I thought was kind of surprising. He, he was busy with Back to the Future. But well, what did you guys think about his uh, directing style? There were a couple things, like the waterfall scene Yeah, was just over too quickly. There were just some things where I thought I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of that and a little bit less of some other stuff. But this is a sweet film, and I thought he did a good job. I did read that Kathleen Turner complained about his directing <laughs> style. And that's kind of where I'm going to go into my portion, but I wanted to hear what you guys had to say. It seems like it is so incredibly bound up in the 80s. If an alien came to planet Earth and was like, hey, man, what was popular art like in the 80s? I'd say, oh, let me get you a copy of Romancing the Stone. Because from the music, the, the humor, everything just seems like it comes out of that era so much that, you know, I feel like this movie wasn't directed by a person as much as it was just by the decade itself. <laughs> so again, I don't know if I can separate it from that. It's that 80s feel that just seems like it has lost its luster this day and age. So oh, I'm, your tongue. <laughs> I'm a much bigger fan of his. I love the Back to the Future series, but those don't feel so, you know, dated to me. Well, they went to the future. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and the past. What about Death Becomes Her? That was a great film that he did. Uh, that no. was a good movie. Oh, I did like Death Becomes Her. Uh, I just put down the films that I liked, so sorry. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't like Death Becomes Her. Uh, I love that movie. Chris, what do you think of his directing style? You know, it's kind of like what Matt said. It's really reflective of the decade. And I don't know if necessarily it's reflective of the decade or he helped define the decade. But when you think of the 80s style that... Robert Zemeckis is one of the people that strongly defined it, and I think it's just typical of an 80s film. I will say I did not like the music. The music no. is very dated 80s style. Yeah. It was, wasn't bothered. much of a score. No. I thought there was a song that went with that movie. Yeah, like, it, there was. Song. It went dun 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 dun, dun. <laughs> No, there was a song by Eddie Grant called Romancing the, S the Stone, and you can hear it briefly when they're at the drug dealer in this small town. Uh, he's playing it in the background. But Alfonso? Th yeah, Alfonso. His name was Juan. Juan. But uh, I remember there being a music video, and it showed scenes of it, but it, it's not yeah. actually in the soundtrack. It's not in the credits. It's not anywhere. It was, it was done by Eddie Grant, but there was a, a song that went along with this. Okay, here's my take on Robert Zemeckis. I find this a very interesting film for him because if you look at the rest of his films – after this, almost every single one is special effects driven somehow. Sometimes the special effects overpower the film. Sometimes the special effects are done subtly 
and very, very effectively. I would put into the example of what lies beneath, even flight, that the special effects served the purpose of the story. And Forrest Gump, I thought it was a little gimmicky because they just wanted to put him in Forrest Gump next to all these famous people or these famous scenes. Well, uh, you couldn't even tell that Tom Hanks was computer animated. Yeah, right. <laughs> and what about Beowulf? I find that very realistic. Yeah, Beowulf, you know, uh, Christmas Carol and uh, Polar Express, obviously very animated special effects. But this film, if there's any special effects, it's a live action special effect. They're doing a stunt. They're not actually doing anything digitally. And I know this was kind of around the time of the birth of, of digitally, but I found it very interesting for the perspective that this is an actor who's known for it and, has become, and becomes defined by that, that he has success in something and then it goes almost completely away from it and it literally doesn't kind of do the romantic comedy like this again, ever. And I admire him for, hey, you define this. Hey, I'm not going to do the sequel. I'm going to go do this other thing, and this kind of science fiction comedy. And never returns back to it. I guess you could argue Death Becomes a romantic comedy, but I don't think so. I think it's a comedy, but I don't think it's really romance-driven. Eh, it's not. <laughs> so No, it's not. Yeah. But do you think that's a reflection of his directing style or the changing tastes of audiences? I think it's the evolution of the director. And he was able to direct this to get him the job for Back to the Future. He probably didn't expect it to become as big as it was, but that opens the door for him to do other things like Forrest Gump, where as much as I don't really care for the film Forrest Gump, it is not a film that the special effects aren't distracting in it. And it is, you know, far and away completely different from Back to the Future and Romancing the Stone. And then what he goes on to do afterwards with Contact, which is your more prototypical science fiction film. Uh, what Lies Beneath, a horror film. Uh, the Polar Express, a family Christmas film. Uh, he did a Who Framed Roger Rabbit, didn't he? He did. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Yeah. Oh, who, I like that movie. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which was, once again, very animation special effects, but a completely different genre and film. And I like that you see the beginnings of his directing style here, and he starts associating with the same people who do the same score, same editors and things like that. And going back to something you had mentioned, the Kathleen Turner complained about his directing styles that he wanted her to stand in a certain way and it would made it difficult for her to act or do her performance because he was very technical. And I think he's a very technical director. And I think that was the way he was being technical in this film when he couldn't use special effects. And that's why I think it was interesting to note that this is where he comes from, you know, from this film. Uh, the story of this film I thought there was it was interesting criticism of this film that a lot of critics called it a ripoff of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which had come out three years before. And it's funny because that's how I remember it. But watching it now, it's like this is a wholly different type of adventure film. Yeah, there's kind of a jewel or a, kind of an artifact to get, but it was modern era. It's set in South America. It's got romance and comedy. I don't see it that similar to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Did you guys get that feel? As you're watching it? No, I think if you're going to say that, you're going to say that every adventure movie is a ripoff of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, it's clearly in that genre, but this is its own movie. I don't even think it's in the same genre. I would put this more comedy than adventure, and Raiders mm -hmm. of the Lost Ark is a flat-out adventure film. I would say this is, distinguishes itself to me as an adventure more than a comedy, just because that's everything the plot rev revolves around, which is just another reason to say that this is not a ripoff of Raiders of the Lost Ark by any stretch. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a ripoff. And also, I read that the screenplay was written before Raiders of the Lost Ark. So if anybody was ripping anybody off. <laughs> well, that's presuming George Lucas and Steven Spielberg <laughs> read the screenplay. <laughs> I know I didn't feel that way. I mean, there were like, as you said, there were minor parallels, but there's minor parallels in a million stories. I agree because there are definitely elements of it, but in all the overall story, it's not even Indiana Jones with the twist. It is its own distinct story from beginning to end. If anything, it might have ripped off the Crystal Skull, Indiana Jones. But okay, now you're just trying to poke the bear. That's all you're doing right now. So. <laughs> A lot of films have hidden symbolism and deeper meanings. Chris, you're going to have to dig hard, I think, in this film to look for a deeper meaning and symbolism in this film. 
Well, as you know, Joan Wilder is a romance novelist. And at the beginning of this film, her publicist was trying to find somebody that would take her heart. And this whole movie was revolving around finding El Corazón, which is Spanish for the heart. So I think there was a huge symbolic meaning to this, that the treasure map wasn't really the piece of paper. It was this adventure that Joan Wilder and Jack Colton went on and that the actual heart that was being won was not this emerald, but was actually Joan Wilder's heart for this guy. I mean, you said that you didn't think this was much of a romance at the beginning, but I think that if you look at it in that perspective as to what the real heart is that they were searching for, I think that this does become more of a romance movie. Are you saying the whole thing was a dream? <laughs> you know, actually, you joke, but if they hadn't made that crappy Nile sequel, I would have argued that this film was a 100% a dream and that she wrote in her house after her little party with her cat and the feast. <laughs> she did write it. Well, she did write it, but I would have argued that none of this ever <laughs> happened, that she was actually oh, okay. just like uh, the beginning of the film where he was in the West and, you know, shooting up the place, I would have said that this whole movie is a figment of her imagination. But they made the sequel and screwed up that theory. <laughs> <laughs> screwed up a lot of theories, so. Yeah. Maybe the sequel was a book, It too. could have been. When they were back in Cartagena and Jack actually did show up, he put the jewel in his pants, in his crotch. And I still think that was a subtle joke that's saying... The heart was next to his penis that he had sex with Joan and that her heart literally was wrapped around his penis. So I think there was a lot of subtle things that both sexual and love related that he stole her heart. Well, so we're talking like, was he wearing a jock strap? I kept wondering how he pulled that off. You know, is some kind of a well, adhesive, he didn't. perhaps? No. It was kept together with sexual tension. Well, Michael Douglas is well endowed, and so he just wrapped around it. <laughs> Remember what you saw good. was okay, not the jewel okay. dropping down okay. his pants, but him unraveling. All right, let's, move on. let's move on. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I see that symbolism, Chris. But I agreed with the other stuff, yeah. and I just thought it it was sweet that you. I mean, it's ironic that you have this wildly popular romance novelist that has no romance in her life in the way they meet and stuff. And it would have to be exciting for somebody that writes those kind of stories. So I thought it was a sweet story. This movie, what it wanted to be was just one of her, her cheesy romance novels come to life. And so I think this whole idea of pursuing the heart was really her heart. But it was really a jewel, too. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's there. I, I, I don't think it, it's a stretch by any means. I, um, but Matt, is there any more greater treasure than the love of a good woman? Well, there's a very valuable stone. <laughs> that can buy you the boat of your dreams. I mean, how many stones are there like that? There's three and a half billion women in this world. I mean, shoot. That's and true. And as long as she's got the map to his heart, she'll always be there. That's true. Matt, what about your moral universe portion? Well, again, I think this is a movie that isn't trying to be subtle. It wears its heart on its sleeve? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wears its heart in the, in the little uh, cup of its jockstrap. I think that the arc of Joan's character kind of valorizing her shift from damsel in distress to more independent type of person where she learns to embrace the adventure and thrive in the danger. Besides the value of the love of a good woman, the idea that we can embrace adventure in our lives is probably the best message this movie or the most obvious message this movie has to offer. I thought it was a really interesting way that they, towards the end of the film, She's trying to save her sister. She's being attacked by the one-handed Zolo. He's trying to get the jewel back. That's what he's concerned about is the jewel or, in Chris's analogy, her heart. But he's hanging on to the crocodile. She needs his help. He hesitates, 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 and then finally lets the crocodile go and he goes up to, to rescue between her. the hearts. Which and get there at a moot point. In well, the I know, and that, that was an interesting that. He doesn't actually help her or save her in any way, shape, or form. Which but, further shows her evolution. No, as a no character. It makes it, it's a full evolution for her, but it shows absolutely no evolution for him because even after that, he's like, "See ya, got to go find the croc." You know. I also and, kind of picture him scaling that wall and looking to his left to see a staircase leading directly to the roof. <laughs> That'd be too easy. I think that showed that they don't need each other 
that he doesn't need her, she doesn't need him, but they chose each other. Huh. Okay. Did he choose her? I mean, he it, did. He dropped the crocodile. Yeah, but then, then he, he leaves her. But he came back. Mm. Yeah, with the boat. With the boat. He wanted with- to eat his cake and have a cake. Okay. He spent all his money on a boat and he went, she's a rich romance novelist. Hmm. I think I'm going to go find her. Oh, you are so unromantic. I never, that thought never occurred to me. <laughs> well, and, you know, in his defense, that boat kind of was his thing. It wasn't like he did something for her. It was like, hey, baby, check out my boat. Well, let's talk about the ending of the film, although we've already touched on it. Lori loves the romantic Hollywood ending. He comes by with the boat and picks her up, pop that balloon by saying, yeah, he didn't have any more money because he bought the boat. And she's a rich romantic novelist. So he's latching onto a sugar mama. That's how I see the end. How do you guys see the end? I see it exactly the same way that she is. I don't even know that she's in love with him, but she thinks that she's found that character she's in love with, if that makes sense. Because she was always looking for her, um, what was her guy's name in her novels? Oh, I can't Uh, remember. Yeah, she was looking for that guy, and she thought that uh, Jack T. Colton embodied that. I don't know if we know at the end or not, but they did sail off into the urban jungle at the end. I can't see anything sinister in him coming back. I think it's just the way they had to complete this movie. I mean, I don't remember the second movie. I haven't seen it in a really long time. So I, I would assume ending this movie that he probably had all the money he needed. And he Spoiler was, alert, the jewel of the Nile is not an actual jewel. <laughs> I think he was coming back just to give that romance payoff to the audience. He said he couldn't stop thinking about her. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to believe that lion man? Yes. I believe him. He was living in a jungle a... for 30 years. He hadn't seen a woman other than in a magazine. He hadn't been there 30 years. It's, <laughs> he's been there like three, I think he I, said. Uh, I liked her character. I could see him falling in love with her. Maybe he wasn't ready to commit yet, but he was. And, and the sequel proved out that he... Did fall in love with her, so there. <laughs> no, what the sequel proved out is they had problems, and he, he had. <laughs> Everybody to, has problems. Well, I know. As I said, I don't see this as that much of a romance between the two of them. That I don't see the chemistry as much in this film as I did in the later Michael Douglas Kathleen Turner films. Why would he want to be with her? Because she's the constant damsel in distress she wants to be with him because she thinks he's this guy from the novels but he is not as he proves throughout the film that he's you know clumsy he's very self-centered he's uh, he's just in it for the money this is not the heroic character that she dreams of and wanting to be with the rest of her life yeah he does make some decisions to help her out but does does he actually even come to cartagena at the end you know when they're on the different sides of the river he says, I'll meet you there. I'll, I'll prove it. You know, basically, I'm going to prove it to you that I'm a good guy. But do we know he actually came there? Or was he brought there by the bad guys who caught him? You really, I believe he was headed there. I, I, that's what you choose to believe. I believe that he was brought <laughs> there by the bad guys because he says, we missed you at the hotel. He was there with the bad guys. So I see him as not really that good a guy. And the evolution of his character comes in the second film, and he becomes more of a good guy. I I see of him as a, a good time Charlie just looking for the next little, you know, payout for him. And that and that's how I interpret this film. And I enjoy the film for what it is, but that I don't I don't buy the romance in it and I, I see the I guess the darker side of it. Uh let's talk about the film's legacy. This shouldn't take very long. Nominated <laughs> <laughs> Nominated for one Academy Award, Best Film Editing. I was even surprised of that. Uh, lost to the Killing Fields that year. However, won two Golden Globe Awards that year, Best Motion Picture, Comedy Slash Musical, and Best Actress for Kathleen Turner in a Comedy or a Musical. So this actually won. I mean, Golden Globes are a little bit more prestigious, a little, little more popularity contest in the Golden Globes, but uh, I was kind of surprised it actually won the Best Motion Picture spawned a sequel that we've referred to multiple times, The Jewel of the Nile, which actually came out the uh, the holiday season the following year. 
they were a third film called the crimson eagle was planned but never made it out of the development stage in the late 80s and i read how michael douglas had tried to even reboot or relaunch the franchise with a third film in the 2000s on two different occasions and it just never went any place Rotten Tomatoes, 87% critics, pretty standard, 69% audience. That's a big difference, and I'm kind of surprised with that one. And as far as legacy, that's about it. There isn't a lot of uh, acclaim on this one. No AFIs, no National Film Registry. Are you surprised by this, the the legacy here? And I'll start with you, Chris. Your film. Not really. I mean, this is a, I think this was more of a, I wouldn't say a quieter film. It, I would consider this today almost to be more of an independent sort of film that maybe a major studio wouldn't pick up but would still be made and still have a nice audience. And uh, that's kind of what I like about it. And uh, no, it, it doesn't surprise me. I, I will say that I didn't think that it was that comedic, so I'm a little bit surprised that any, they would have been doing any comedy awards other than Danny DeVito's role. <laughs> but other than that, no, I'm not terribly surprised on that. I'm not surprised. <laughs> No, I I I don't think this is a kind of a piece of filmmaking that normally draws widespread acclaim, so I'm not surprised by the legacy. All right. I'm gonna say that I am surprised by the legacy, but I'm gonna go the other way. I can't believe it won two Golden Globes and was nominated (laughs) for an Academy Award. I'm surprised it even got that kind of attention. Um it's not the type of film that I would expect to get any Academy Award nominations, let alone a film editing. I mean maybe a best song or uh, best special effects if there was a special effect but it's not there but best film editing usually goes to the five films that are nominated for best picture and this one wasn't one of those so all right uh let's wrap it up here would you put this is one of your hundred greatest films of all time and we'll start with uh laurie on this one i think she's telegraphed her punch already no i would not it is a an enjoyable film but it did not make my top 100 or probably my top 200. Now, Laura, you're a child of the 80s. Did you see this in the 80s or is this a more recent viewing for you? This was my first time. Really? I've, I've got, never seen this movie. I'm kind of surprised. Did you like it? That is surprised because HBO had it all the time. Yeah, I know. Now, just not whether it's in your top 100 or top 200. Did you like the film? I did. Okay. Yeah, it was an enjoyable film. I really liked this movie when I was a kid, but I really liked Pixie Sticks when I was a kid. I appreciate what this movie's trying to do. It's original. I think it, it provides something great for its audience. I am just not this movie's audience. So I'm leaving it out of my top 100. I own this movie. In fact, I think Matt borrowed my copy of this film to watch. I liked this film a lot when I was a kid, but I've got a very similar take to Matt as that as I've grown up, I've outgrown this film to a certain extent i still enjoy it i still like it uh i'll watch it from time to time but it is a product of the 80s it is very much a very very dated film by the soundtracks the clothes uh, even the, the comedy style of the film even the actors to a large extent you know having el guapo el guapo play the drug dealer in the town i mean that's what i know him for is the the films of the 80s and everything is so 80s derivative that it really this film really punctuates a decade for me and not in a and bad there's way nothing wrong with that. no there's nothing <laughs> no there's nothing wrong with it I, I that's one of the reasons i wanted to ask you because i thought you hadn't seen it before and what you, if you even liked it i like this film i have nothing there's things wrong with this film, and I wouldn't put it in my top 100, probably wouldn't put it in my top 200, but I like the film, okay? It's it's enjoyable. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's an enjoyable little film, and for no, no other reason than just to see the finished story of these two characters and watch Jewel of the Nile. Jewel of the Nile is by far and away not as good a film as this film. But it does complete a story between these two characters, and I would have been curious to see where they would have taken a third film. They, with the summary I read mentioned that they go on an adventure to Thailand with their kids. Not sounding as enjoyable as I would have liked to have seen, but, you know... I, I, Wait, that was War of the Roses. <laughs> <laughs> so these two characters die on the floor in their house. Well, that's nice. <laughs> that was the third. That was yeah. the end of the trilogy. Yeah. Not a very happy ending for these. Uh, however, this is Chris's pick, and he gets final say on this. So, Chris, 
uh, what say you? You know, for the first time, we're going to have all four that are not in the top 100. Why did you pick this movie then? (laughs) He broke the rules. I broke the rules. It's been about eight, ten years since I've seen this. And I pretty much agree with Matt. I have outgrown this film. I was a little disappointed watching it this time. And although it is enjoyable, and I still think of it fondly from when I was growing up in the 80s, I can't put this in my top 100. I will definitely put it in my top 200. But I will tell you, in watching it this time, I was definitely a little disappointed in the strength of the story and the overall feel of the film. I think it is a little dated now, and I have outgrown it just as Patrick and Matt. Well, there you have it. Anything can happen on Movie House Memories. Thank you for joining this week's review, lunchtime movie review, uh, <laughs> from as, Missing the as Stone. As we have now said that this one sucks. Basically, Thanks uh, for uh, letting us waste an hour of your life. We didn't say it sucks. It's just it's just not as good as we remember no, it. So no, it, it definitely is not. I, I can sincerely say that there were times when I was bored watching this one, and I was looking at the clock. And that should not happen if it's a top 100 movie. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this, this review of Romancing the Stone. Thanks once again for joining us and listening into our little podcast. Uh, if you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories on either Facebook or Twitter. You can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films, and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts. For instance, the James Bond podcast, the male bonding that Chris and Matt and I do, uh, Sans Lori. Uh, the second episode came out last week, and also last week was the return of Lunchtime Movie Review with Surf Nazis Must Die, also a Chris pick. <laughs> <laughs> There's a theme going on here. <laughs> this is a Chris month. So, uh, but uh, stay tuned for our new episodes. The uh, Goldfinger, uh, one of the quintessential James Bond films, we reviewed on June 7th. And we're still looking to see what film we're going to review next for a lunchtime movie review for June 10th's episode. So stay tuned for that. If you've enjoyed yourselves and you downloaded us off iTunes, make sure to rate our podcast uh, on iTunes. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any fans of the show, even if it's constructive criticism. Uh, Finally, if you're a fan of the show, help us keep it going. If you're considering making a purchase through Amazon.com, Enter the Amazon site through our website at moviehousememories.com. Once there, click on any one of the numerous Amazon banners on the page to enter amazon.com, and then just simply make your selection and your purchase. A portion of your purchase will go to support the upkeep of Movie House Memories. It doesn't cost you anything additional to do so, but it does help us pay the normal bills that are associated with bandwidth and maintaining a website and now various podcasts. Don't forget you can buy almost anything off Amazon.com, including not just books and music and movies, but uh, almost anything, including Romancing the Stone, which is not going to be in the top 100 of Movie House Memories. But you can also get uh, The Jewel of the Nile or War of the Roses, which are also War of the Roses is a pretty good film. I like that film. Next time we do one of Lori's films that she believes should be in the top 100 and should be in the top one, her top 100, Lori. (laughs) And that would be 2006 Pride and Prejudice. I don't know what year it came out. I'm sorry. I think it's 2005. Uh, it's 2005's. Pri- uh, it's the it's Pride and Prejudice from 2000, the 2000s Kira with Kira Knightley uh, off the top of my head. It's either 2005, 2006, 2004, somewhere in there. Middle 2000s. The 2000s. <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. So, oh, so wait, are we doing Pride and Prejudice and Zombies? Or are we doing it without the zombies? No, without, without the, the zombies, zombies this time. That will be another one that I re- review later on. So Did that come out? No, not yet. 2015. <laughs> I read the book. Because <laughs> I'll read anything, Pride and Prejudice. Apparently. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, until next time, uh, I'm Patrick. I'm Debbie Downer. <laughs> I'm Lori. And I'm Matt. And we'll see you next time at our house.
This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories Hiding Your Reality is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. 